That's dirty. <laughs> so it's really nice if you come down a little closer to this really extraordinary panel that we are very fortunate to have with us this afternoon. I mean, honestly, what could be better than talking about Bratislav Havel with former Secretary Madeleine Albright and Havel's great friend and spokesperson, Ambassador Martin Palouche, and to have performed right before our very eyes excerpts from Havel's protest. You know, these are pretty bleak times, as we uh, can't avoid repeating, and it is so great to be reminded of those really piercing lights in other bleak times. So we should all take heart, I think, and uh, be inspired. I'm not sure uh, that I need to introduce the panelists. I think you can figure out that we are so honored to have our very distinguished faculty member, I really can say beloved faculty member, legendary faculty member, former Secretary Madeleine Albright. There is a tone that students who are in her courses adopt when they say they're in, their, in her courses. And it's this tone of kind of excitement and reverence all at once. And they always have a big grin on their faces. They just can't. Uh, avoid it. It's really a, a great experience that Georgetown students are so lucky to have. Uh, and it's also wonderful to have her great friend and also Havel's great friend, uh, Ambassador Martin Palouche, who is now living in the United States. You can see his bio, but he is leading a center in Florida on Václav Havel and human rights. So very appropriate. Human rights and diplomacy. Two words we don't hear together enough that someone is doing. Uh, and we're also very fortunate to have Susan Galbraith, the Artistic Director uh, of the Alliance for New Music Theater, who have produced the performance and, and produced it and taken it on the road, uh, of which we are going to see excerpts. So what I'd like to do is to begin with one of the readings from Havel's play, Protest, and we're lucky to have with us David Millstone, and Drew Valens, who will bring this scene to life for us. Thank you. Take it away. All right. Um, let me just preface this. Um, I'm, I want to make a very short introduction, but I also want to connect for our distinguished guests what I have been able to experience the last couple of days. And I want to tie two things that have been themes one, the idea that artists are disturbers of the peace. And of course, Václav Havel, as some of you may know, wrote one of, one of the many things he wrote was called Disturbing the Peace. And the other theme that has come up, uh, especially yesterday, was the whole idea of hope. So this is from Disturbing the Peace, and I just want to read one definition from Mr. Havel. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. So, in this first scene from Protest, a little short excerpt, uh, two friends have just reconnected after a long separation. They had once been part of a radical dissident group, in the intervening years, Vanyek, played by Drew Valens, has served time in prison as a political prisoner, while Stanyek, David Millstone, has managed to stay out of trouble, carve out some commercial success as a television writer, and live in comparative comfort. Did they beat you? No. Do they beat people up in there? Sometimes, but not the politicals. I thought about you a great deal, you know. Thank you. I bet in those days it never even occurred to you. What? Well, how it'll all end up. I bet not even you could have guessed that. Hmm. 
Well, it's disgusting. Ferdinand, it's disgusting. The nation is governed by scum. And the people, I mean, can this really be the same nation that not all that long ago behaved so magnificently? All that horrible bowing, cringing, and scraping, all the selfishness, corruption, and fear wherever you turn. I mean, what are they made of us, old pal? Can this really be us? Well, I don't really believe things are as black as all that. <laughs> well, you'll forgive me, Ferdinand, but you don't happen to live in a normal environment. I mean, all you know are people who manage to resist to this rot. You just keep on supporting one another. You have no idea the kind of environment I have to put up with. You really don't have anything to do with it anymore. It makes you sick to your stomach. Oh, you mean television? Yeah, I mean television. In the film studios, you name it. There was a piece by you on TV the other day. Oh, you won't believe what an ordeal that was first. <laughs> they kept walking it for over a year. Then they started changing it all around. They changed my whole opening, the entire closing sequence. You wouldn't believe the trifles that they find objectionable these days. It's nothing but sterility and intrigues. Intrigues and sterility. How often I tell myself, wrap it up, chum, forget it, hide away someplace, grow apricots. <laughs> I know what you mean. The thing is, one can't help wondering if one has a right to this sort of escape. I mean, supposing the little one might be able to accomplish today can, in spite of everything, help someone in some way. At least give him a little bit of encouragement. Uplift him a little. And I'm going to get you a pair of slippers. <laughs> slippers? What? You can't be comfortable in those boots. I'm all right. Are you sure? Yes. Really? How about drugs? <coughs> uh, did they give you any? No. <coughs> no dubious injections. Only some vitamin ones. I bet there was some funny stuff in the food. Just bromine against sex. Huh. But surely they tried to break you down somehow. Well, no, if you don't want to talk about it, that's all right with me. Well, that's the whole point of pretrial interrogations, isn't it? To bring one down a peg or two? And to make one talk. Hmm. You know, they should haul me in for questioning, which sooner or later is bound to happen. You know what I'm going to do? What? Simply not answer any of their questions. Refuse to speak to them at all. That is by far the best way. At least that way one can be quite sure one hasn't said anything one ought not to have said. <laughs> anyway, you must have steel nerves to bear up under it all and in addition to keep on doing the things that you do. Like what? Oh, I mean all the, all the protests, the petitions, the letters. <laughs> The whole fight for human rights. Um, the things that you and your friends keep on doing. I'm not doing so much. Oh. Don't be too modest, Ferdinand. I know. I follow everything that goes on. Oh, if everybody did what you do, the situation would be quite different. And that is a fact. It's extremely important that we have at least a few people here who are unafraid to speak the truth aloud. To defend others? To call a spade a spade? Now, and what I'm going to say is going to sound a bit solemn, perhaps. But frankly, the way I see it, you and your friends have taken on an almost superhuman task to preserve and to carry the remains, the remnants of a moral conscience through the present quagmire. The thread you're spinning may be thin, but who knows? Perhaps the hope of a moral rebirth of the nation hangs on. You exaggerate! <laughs> that's 
The way I see it, anyway. Surely our hope lies in all of the decent people. But how many of them are still around? <laughs> how many? Enough. Are there? <laughs> still, it's you and your friends who are most exposed to view. Yes, but isn't that precisely what makes it easier for us? I wouldn't say so. Because the more you're exposed, the more responsibility you have to all those who know right. about you, trust you, rely on you, and look up to you. Because in some respects, you are upholding their honor, too. And I am going to get you those slippers! <laughs> Please, don't bother! <sighs> that he provoked in those around him. You see how powerfully that worked. We've just seen this fantastic passage about friendship. So I want to start with that, uh, with these two friends of Havel, different kinds of friends, friends of different parts of his life. And if you wouldn't mind, Madam Secretary, beginning, tell us a little bit about your friendship. We could easily talk about that for the next hour and a half. That's a very tempting, so I'm going to have to ask you to condense it and maybe focus a little bit on when you first came to America. But tell us how it began. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here and very uh, moved by what you've done so far. The great play. So, and thank you. Um, and we are friends, too. So, but let me just say the following thing. What happened was um, I was born in Czechoslovakia, and I was writing my dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in 1968, Prague Spring. And what happened, there was a man that appeared in the United States, his name was Yuzhi Dinspear, who had kept Radio Prague on the air all through the Soviet invasion. And he was sent to the United States basically to be kept safe. And I spent my time at the Library of Congress reading the newspapers, but Dinspear would made it all come alive for me because he could tell me who the people were and all that. He went back to Czechoslovakia and was arrested a number of times, a complicated story. But with the Velvet Revolution, he became the foreign minister. And I called him up and I, the phone call went right through and I said, what can I do to help? And he said, help the students. They're the ones that did the Velvet Revolution. So I then do go to Prague in January 90 I went with the National Democratic Institute, and Dean Spear first took me to audience, which is another part of the set of plays. So we did that in the evening. And then he said, come by the foreign ministry to see me. And I went and I did that. And by the way, my father had been chief of staff to Jan Masaryk, the foreign minister, when I was a little girl. And I'd been to that office when I was six years old. And so it was very, or seven, I was taken back to this office, and I'm sitting there. Did you remember it? Yes, you know, so anyway, so then Dean Spears says, would you like to meet Havel? And I said, yes. So we go over to the castle to meet him, and I happen to have a copy of a book my father wrote called 20th Century Czechoslovakia, and I'm handing it to President Havel, and he says, I know who you are. You're Mrs. Fulbright. And I said, no, I'm Mrs. Albright. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of our friendship. And what happened was he then asked me, they were all dressed in blue jeans and black turtles. And, uh, and he said, would you go with my advisors to this restaurant right around the corner and explain to them, because I had said that I'd worked for President Carter. And, explain what a presidential office looks like and how it all works. So I'm there drawing various uh, diagrams. And then uh, it was January, it was snowing, and I walked back to my hotel, and I had my only out-of-body experience, which was I thought I'd never left here. And then I thought, well, I wouldn't know what a president's office looked like if I hadn't left here. But it really was the beginning of a friendship. President Havel came to the United States, and I did all the advance for the trip. And 
the first thing he did was come to Georgetown to meet with the students. Uh, because he really did want to start that way. And we were friends from then on, and it was the most, there's no other way to describe it. Being friends with somebody like him was incredible, and fun, and very moving, and it's one of the greatest joys of my life. Wonderful answer. We'll come back to some of your experiences together. But Ambassador Palusha, I'll turn to you now, because you knew um, Havel before he was President Havel and helped him along the way there, but also knew him in his younger years. So give us a sense of that friendship first as a regular person, then someone who's in the struggle with you, and then the inspiration for you and really the whole country. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and I would say important uh, event or gathering. Uh, I will try to be very brief. Uh, there are three uh, dates important in my life. 1968, I was uh, close to 18. 1977, Charter 77's origin. 1989, Velvet Revolution. I met Havel for the first time as a young student, just shaking his hand. Nothing more in the fall of 1968 when our uh, revolution of that year was lost. Soviet tanks were already there and people started to change their minds uh, in the process of so-called normalization. 1977 was that really brought us together uh, as active friends. Uh, everybody who decided to sign Charter 77 uh, had to be aware of the fact that it would it, going to be a great loss for him. Uh, loss of opportunities, loss of career, many uh, unpleasant troubles, uh, being exposed to secret police and so on and so forth, uh, checking out uh, detention cells, so prisons from inside, and uh, I can go on and on. Uh, but there was a significant compensation for this loss, and it was friendships. Uh, you could really establish in this moment, these friendships were much more genuine. They were not dependent on I would say that you had the same taste or you believed in the same ideas. You were in the same situation. And uh, the feeling of solidarity and being together was very strong and Havel was certainly a very important person in that respect. Mm -hmm. And 89 was a crazy year of revolution, a revolutionary action uh, that was uh, certainly not, I would say, intended, men made think. I don't want to pretend that we were revolutionaries uh, having clear idea what we are doing. We were put into certain situation in which we had to act in a way and not lose the opportunity that uh, was offered by that situation. And now inspiration. Uh, I just would like to repeat now what Havel kept, kept saying uh, whenever his plays uh, were to be presented. Every good play must be more clever than its author. It uh, had to be able to articulate something more than his intentions, to uh, awake some, someone in all of us to ask questions, to be provoked, challenged, and asked. So I think that this is the question today, uh, just seeing this beautiful performance. I think that Hubble's absurdity is here. It's not just what we had uh, 35 years ago in Czechoslovakia. Uh, uh, this conversation could take place today as uh, it uh, uh, took place when Havel tried to articulate that. So uh, I think that inspiration by Havel is uh, that it starts to be active in the moment uh, when we accept uh, his philosophy of his play. Uh, he always said that don't want to see to cheap, uh, I would say, comparison. The play is not imitation of real world. Uh, a play is creating its own world. And uh, you have to first establish connection. So the question is, who is Vanyek and who is Tanyek? Uh, Havel is not uh, Vanyek, but I guess that he has also his Tanyek inside of himself, and vice versa. So I think that uh, this is a very interesting play. It was written in 1978, uh, after he spent his first uh, four months in jail, uh, when he became a spokesperson for Charter 77. And he made a terrible mistake uh, there in this, uh, when he was in Rusinje. Uh, he was aware of it, he was writing about that later, and when he was uh, uh, sentenced to four years uh, prison later, he believed himself that it was some sort of uh, right punishment he was deserving for his mistake. His mistake was that he started to talk. 
uh, to uh, his interrogators, not to betray his friends, uh, but because of, he was a man of communication, mm -hmm. and uh, he really uh, was only checking out this strange world you never know without uh, entering it. Uh, and uh, uh, then he, uh, his greatness was that he was able to reflect on his uh, experience and uh, turn it into knowledge, because this is what theater is about. Make a tragic experience, and then turn it into some sort of noise. So what you are going to see now. You are definitely speaking to an audience uh, for whom those words resonate, because you're speaking to an audience of theater makers, plenty of whom work in very challenging circumstances, <coughs> not that different uh, from what Havel uh, endured in his time. So this play and what you're saying, both of you are saying, is a really timely relevance for this audience in particular, and we are definitely going to give you all a chance to ask your questions as well. I think now let's turn to the second excerpt, and then we'll talk a little more about Havel's legacy and other aspects that were important to him, such as music, and then we'll turn to you. So, um, just one thing. Of course, most of you know that the the plays were banned from public performance, and so they were done in apartment performances, and which meant you know private living rooms of people. And I just want to say, part of what the experience then must have been electrifying, as this is in a way, because we have one of the signers of Charter 77, and both of you being friends of Hobble, this would have been the audience that would have been watching it and knowing the characters and knowing the inside jokes, as you do, and you're also watching them watch this. <laughs> so I'm very uh, conscious of these of this frisson that's that's happening. So for the second uh, excerpt, this is uh, while it becomes clear that Stanyak has invited Vanyek over to help him leverage assistance in the form of drafting a protest. In this case, it's to release a young musician in the, in the story. Uh, the tables are turned when we discover that Vanyak <coughs> also has an ask of Stanyak. So I'll just leave it at that. What do you think about my idea of writing some sort of protest? I guess that's the sort of thing you had in mind? <coughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, wh what is it? Have a look. That's a laugh, isn't it? Oh. Oh, here I am, cudgeling my brain, how to go about it. Finally, I, I take the plunge and consult you. And all this time, you had the whole thing wrapped up and ready to go. Isn't it marvelous? I knew I was doing the right thing when I turned to you. <laughs> yeah. It's there, it's, it's, it's precisely what I had in mind. It's brief, to the point, fair, and yet emphatic. It's manifestly the work of a professional. Now, I'd be sweating over this for an entire day, and I would never come up with anything <coughs> remotely like this. Uh, uh, listen, it's just a small point, though. <laughs> Here at the end, do you think that um, willfulness is the right word to use? I mean, couldn't one find a milder 
A synonym, perhaps? I mean, it somehow seems a bit misplaced, you know? I mean, the whole text is composed in very measured, factual terms, and this one word suddenly sticks out. It sounds far too emotional. Wouldn't you agree? Otherwise, it's absolutely perfect. <laughs> Well, maybe the second paragraph has been denied. In fact, it's just a rehash of the first. Oh, except for this reference here to Yavurek's impact on nonconformist youth. Oh, 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 this is excellent. Oh, it must stay in. How about putting it at the end instead of no, your willfulness? No, no, no. Wouldn't that do the trick? Oh, but. These are just my personal impressions. Oh, good heavens. Why should you listen to what I have to say? On the whole, the text is excellent and will no doubt hit the mark. Oh, let me say again, Ferdinand, how much I admire you. Your knack for expressing the fundamental points of an issue while avoiding all needless abuse is indeed Rare among our kind. Oh, come on, you don't really mean that. <laughs> anyway, it's good to know that one's always around, well, somebody around one can turn to and rely on in, in a case like this. But it's only natural, isn't it? Oh, it may seem so to you, but in the circles where I have to move, it's not in the least bit natural. The natural response is much more likely to be the exact opposite. When a man gets into trouble, everyone drops him, the lot of them. Out of fear for their own positions, they tell all and sundry they, they never had anything to do with him. On the contrary, they sized him up right away. They had his number. And why am I telling you all this? I mean, you know the best, the sort of thing that happens, right? I mean, when you were in prison, your longtime theater pals held forth against you on television. It was revolting. I'm not angry with them. But I am. What's more, I told them so, in no uncertain terms. You know, a man in my position has to learn to put up with a lot of things. But you'll forgive me, there are limits. I appreciate it might be awkward for you to blame them because you happen to be the injured party to listen to me. You have to distance yourself from the affair, just think. Once we, too, begin to tolerate this sort of muck, we are de facto assuming co-responsibility for the entire moral morass and indirectly contributing to its deeper penetration. Am I right? Hmm? Have you sent it off yet? We're still collecting signatures. Oh, how many have you got so far? About 50. 50? Not bad. Well, never mind, I guess I just missed the boat is all. Well, no, you, you have. But the thing's already in hand, isn't it? Yes, yes but now it's going to be sent off and published, well, right? Yeah. By the way, I wouldn't get to any of the local agencies of our EU. They'll only print a measly little news item, which is bound to be overlooked. You better hand it over directly to one of the big European papers so the whole text gets published, including all the signatures. Yes, I know. <laughs> Do they already know about it? I mean, police? Yes. I don't think so. I, I suppose not. Right, look here, I don't want to give you any advice, but it seems to me you ought to wrap the whole thing up as soon as possible, or else they'll get wind of it and try to find a way to stop it. Fifty signatures should be enough. Besides, what counts is not the number of signatures, but their significance. Each signature has its own significance. Absolutely. But as far as publicity abroad is concerned, it is essential that a few well-known names be represented. Is Pavel signed? Yes. Good. His name, no matter what one might think of him personally, does mean something in the world today. Absolutely, of course. No doubt. <laughs> Uh, listen, Ferdinand, there's um, one more thing I wanted to discuss with you. It, it, it's a bit delicate, though. Oh, 
Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm no millionaire, you know, but so far I have managed to. Well, good for you. Well, look, I was thinking. Now, a lot of your friends have lost their jobs, and, well, I, I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be prepared to accept from me a certain sum of money? Oh, that's very nice of you. Some of my friends do indeed find themselves in a bit of a spot, but you know there are, there are problems, you know? I mean, one is never quite sure how to go about it. Often those that most need help are most reluctant to accept. Well, you're not going to be able to work miracles with what I can afford, but I expect there are situations in which every penny counts. Here, please, a small offering. Thank you very much. Let me thank you on behalf of all my friends. Gracious Ferdinand, we have to help each other out, right? Listen, by the way, there's no need for you to mention that this little contribution comes from me. I mean, I don't wish to erect a monument to myself. I'm sure you've gathered that much by now. Yes. <laughs> Again, many thanks. Uh, good. Well, ha! Now, how about taking a look at the garden? Mr. Stunyan. Uh, yes. We'd like to send it off tomorrow. What? The protest. Excellent. Sooner the better. So that today, the today, you should think about getting some sleep. That's the main thing. Yes. Remember, you have a bit of a hangover from last night, and tomorrow is going to be a hard day for you. Yes, I know. Better go straight home and unplug the phone. Else Landowski brings you up again, and heaven knows how you'll end up. Yeah, I know. I was only going to yeah. say we've only got a few signatures left to collect. It won't take long. I was just going to say, I mean, don't you think that it would be helpful? As a matter of fact, it would, of course. It would be sensational. After all, everybody has read your crash. Oh, come on, Fernand. That was 15 years ago. Yes, but it's never been forgotten. What do you mean, sensational? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I was under the impression that you'd actually like to... What? Participate. Participate? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Are you talking about this? Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. You mean I... I was under the impression... <laughs> That's a laugh, isn't it? What's a laugh? Oh, come on. You can see how absurd it is, can't you? No, I ask you over, hoping you write something about your Vurex case. You produced a finished text. And what's more, one furnished with 50 signatures. I'm bowled over like a little child. I can't believe my eyes and ears. I worry about ways to stop them from ruining your project. And all this time, it never occurs to me to do the one simple, natural thing I ought to have done in the first place. I mean, at once, sign the document myself. You must admit, it's absurd. Hmm. Listen, Ferdinand. Isn't this a really terrifying testimony into the situation into which we've been going? I mean, just think, even I, though I know it's rubbish, even I have gotten used to the idea that the signing of protests is the business of local specialists, professionals in solidarity, dissidents, whereas with the rest of us, whenever we want to do something for the sake of ordinary human decency, we automatically turn to you as if you were a sort of Service establishment for moral matters. In other words, we're here simply to keep our mouths shut and be rewarded by a little peace and quiet. Whereas you're here to speak up for us and to be rewarded by blows on earth and glory in the heavens. Perverse, isn't it? Yeah. And we managed to bring things to such a point that even a fairly intelligent and decent fellow, which with your permission, I still think I am, more or less ready to take this situation for granted, as if it were quite normal, perfectly natural. <laughs> Sickening, isn't it? Sickening the depths we've reached? What do you say? Makes me want to puke, huh? Well, do you think the nation can ever recover from all of this? It's hard to say. But what can one do? Hmm. What? can one do? 
seems clear, doesn't it? In theory, that is. Everyone should start with himself. However, is this country inhabited only by Bunyans? It doesn't seem that everyone can become a fighter for human rights. Not everyone. No. Where is it? What? The list of signatures, of course. I think the first thing I want to ask is just to get both of your responses to that scene and what it evokes for you and what you know of Havel. I remember you saying, Madam Secretary, that if you want to understand Havel, you just need to read his plays. So I'd love to hear from both of you what that evokes from you. Well, I think it was brilliant. And I think you were able to uh, make it him and people around him come alive. So thank you. I think that what it evokes is in so many ways that we are, uh, and he made this clear, that we are mixed in terms of can we really be brave or are we then uh, people that step back when it's really important to do something um, and how hard it is to sign your name uh, and to really stand up for something. At the same time, a sense of guilt about not really being able to step up to it. So, um, but it, it's brilliantly written and brilliantly acted, and I think that it shows that how we have both kinds of people within us, and that there are times you have to really stand up. And I do think, in terms of when I met him, the idea that, first of all, he was president of a country, but more than that, that he had been to prison for what he believed in and what it was like and the various things that he had gone through and then to see the very human part in him in every way and that he treasured friendships and that he understood that not everybody would stand up the way he did. And I think he was surprised sometimes, I don't know if you'd agree, Martin, that he had stood up in, in a certain way because he was, I think he was a very humble man uh, and, uh, and I think that that is the part, but it's interesting because he was this figure, but when he came to the United States, one of the things that he had to go on television and things, and he was really bad on television. And one of the reasons was that he never looked at the camera. And when you asked why, he said, because I've been interrogated, and if you get interrogated, they get your eyes, and you do not look into people's eyes. So the experiences that he had, I think, are the kinds that I appreciate. Uh, first of all, a very excellent performance. It was, uh, uh, for me, a kind of uh, machine of time uh, taking me back uh, to uh, the 1970s and 80s in Czechoslovakia, uh, because obviously the scenes like that when, the, when people were hesitating what they should do, and they had all uh, sort of apologies for themselves, it was a real reality. Uh, so uh, I was thinking, uh, do are we still in the same situation today, in spite of the fact that even in Czech Republic now we have democracy, and so certainly uh, these type of petitions or protests are taking place in a slightly different uh, context. But I think that what was uh, important 
uh, there to ask, was it a dialogue between two different people or dialogue inside of us uh, between two uh, advisors uh, we have uh, inside? And I think that this was something very important for Havel, a very classical thing. Uh, uh, I think Greeks have a name for it, anamnesis, uh, the capability uh, to bring to activity certain internal forces in us uh, that are normally sleeping and then uh, you can make up your mind and make foolish things uh, that goes against all advices of common sense and to sign petition even if you know that those who are going to be reading this petition cannot care less about the result. So this is a, a very peculiar situation and the second thing that was coming to my mind again and again was when Václav Havel, out of some, uh, became president, switched from being dissident to being president, uh, that uh, he was a little bit nervous in his role because uh, he didn't want to be, I would say, a serviceman for the moral uh, conscience of other people. He kept saying, uh, it's up to all of us. Uh, for me and for you, but don't impose on me your own responsibilities. But as the president, it was so easy to celebrate out of sudden our prince from the fairy tale that ended well, that uh, got rid us of a bad dragon or bad king or whoever was his opponent, and now we can only applaud and forget again about uh, uh, this inner self uh, that is in us. Havel spoke certainly much less than his interlocutors. I think that it was very nicely demonstrated in this performance that uh, words and deeds can sometimes serve different, uh, different uh, goals, different objectives. When some people speak too much, they may want to uh, just uh, hide something from themselves. <laughs> and uh, when they are silent, uh, uh, they may be raised important questions by being silent. I think that comes, that's beautifully put, and I think it comes across so uh, clearly in this, for, for someone who, of course, never had the chance to know Václav Havel, you see just embedded in this passage the kind of the integrity and also the humility and the humanity of this person that you can really imagine how with his blue jeans and black turtleneck, people did want to elect him president. That's a rare combination, all of those three things. It's really it's so beautifully brought across. Thank you all so much. So much. I, I like to touch on just a couple of other aspects of Havel and take it into the relevance for today and maybe touch uh, Madam Secretary a little bit on Eastern Europe today. But first I want to touch on another aspect of the arts because we're here in a group of mostly theater makers <coughs> but above all creative people who are engaged in political issues wherever they live, on uh, the importance of music for Havel. I always remember him saying jazz keep, kept hope of freedom alive when he first came to the White House. But you had some great jazz experiences with him. Well, there's no question that music played a very important part in um, the whole dissident movements and any aspect of it and the uh, plastic people of the universe and various kinds of music. And, what happened in the 80s when I would go, and by the way, the first time I went to Czechoslovakia with my American name and husband and passport was in 1967, and I was told at the time that my father had been tried in absentia and sentenced to death. Well, it turns out he wasn't sentenced to death, but he was tried in absentia, so I didn't feel real great about going back until I was asked through USIA to go um, and do some talks there, and I was under the protection of the U.S. government. And so they said that, you, that I needed to go and meet these people where jazz was a big thing in Czechoslovakia, but they not only were actual musicians, but they also created a political movement. And so I had, it was the only cloak and dagger thing I ever did, was I was told to go meet a man in a trench coat by a big day. Uh, <laughs> and then he was going to take me to this place where they were gathered. And so we got on the metro in Prague, and he says, you have to stand very close to me so we can pretend we're lovers. And I thought, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, but we end up at this place 
that which was the jazz section and their most valuable thing they had were issues of Rolling Stone. And so, um, and it's very interesting, the part about the money reminded me of something, which is that I was trying to figure out how to be helpful. And so I gave all the money that I actually had to them. And then we were trying to figure out if I could send them money. And so I came back here and I did some kind of a money order uh, for $600, which I always forget. And so then I got a message back from the head of this, this man, got out sort of saying, thanks for the 600 kisses. Uh, so we figured out it would work, but, but I think the issue of jazz really, the fact that it became kind of central to uh, the po a political movement. And so when Havel came to the United States, he loved, we went to many, many jazz clubs um, and had a great time and he loved it. And then he also loved Lou Reed. And so one of the things we did when there was a state dinner for Havel at the White House with President Clinton, um, they in fact, uh, Lou Reed came. But the funniest part, if I can talk about them, we, when I went to Prague with President Clinton, I was at that time UN ambassador, and it was decided that we would go to a jazz club. And it was shortly after President Clinton's mother had died and people weren't sure he wanted to do that, but he did want to do it. We go to a club and they gave, President Havel gave him uh, a saxophone. And so um, then President Clinton played the saxophone uh, by the way, Havel played the, some kind of instrument, showed he had absolutely no rhythm. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was, the music part of it was really important. And if I may say so, I think jazz is our best ambassador. And when I was Secretary of State, uh, I got very involved with the Thelonious Monk Jazz Institute, which is for children to get them really uh, interested in music and the sense that music the power that music really gives to you. But, but Havel loved the music. And then when the first elections came, Paul Simon came and he sang in the Old Town Square. And the whole great aspect of not just jazz, but American music, American music that really made a big difference. Those are wonderful, really wonderful memories. And of course there was the whole aspect of the inherently uh, dissident nature of American jazz traveling abroad, particularly in the 60s and 70s, still in the 80s, of African American musicians being sent by the U.S. government, the same government that often didn't even allow them in the front door of the theaters where they were performing in the United States, and that they would speak openly about that, and not deny it, and speak openly about it, that made such a strong impression on people. What is this place where you can criticize the government and instead of putting you in jail, they just put you on the plane and you go do it again. <laughs> and uh, so there was, uh, there was the inherent nature of the music and then the very interesting you know, dichotomy of the performers and the music. Did you want to comment on that, Martin, also? Uh, small comments. Uh with all due respect, uh, I don't think it was just only, but uh, rock music was extremely important, and so uh, this it was trial with, well, uh, with the plastic people of the universe. That was one of the original impulse for creation of Charter 77. And there were people who were certainly, Professor Batochka, philosopher, not fan of this type of music. He preferred Beethoven and uh, Sebastian Bach. But uh, as act of solidarity, he went along. Uh, the greatest inspiration, I think, what was Herbert Underground, uh, because uh, and underground participation in the whole process uh, gave to the movement certain rhythm and uh, certain liveliness that otherwise, with all these boring intellectuals, uh, would uh, not uh, be there. So just uh, to be very clear about that, Václav Havel himself uh, and. I have to say that, was not a very talented musician, actually, <laughs> other way around. Uh, the only thing he could do uh, was that he occasionally can serve as a percussionist or drummer. Uh, this no, was what he, uh, there are several documentations on that. But certainly music uh, uh, was a very important part of our liberation process. It was John Baez. Uh, she showed up in Czechoslovakia in 1988, so different type of music. And uh, she had a concert in Bratislava, 
And then Václav Havel was uh, allowed uh, to appear on the stage, introduced by her. Uh, so uh, some American musicians were uh, helping us uh, to get things moving. And the occasion of 20th anniversary, Mendel was also there. It was a fantastic uh, uh, celebration of, with uh, all sorts of musicians. Lou Reed was there, uh, Joan Baez was there, uh, Susan Vega was there, and uh, Fleming, uh, famous uh, opera singer, uh, Rene Fleming, and they were singing together, uh, which was most unbelievable thing. Uh, we have it uh, recorded, and we, uh, it can be shown on a movie. Uh, tell me where you can see Lou Reed singing with Rene Fleming together <laughs> in Prague. You know, what's so interesting about that is the um, two things. One, the, the fact that the American musicians were really important, but also plastic people of the universe, the people, the local people who adapted the rock music. And I think of at least one diplomat who really did have rhythm, Andras Shimoni, the former ambassador from Hungary who came here, gave his first public address at the Rock and Roll Museum in Cleveland and always spoke about how much as a teenager rock and roll music had meant to him. One more thing, when the plastic people uh, had their process, one of the people that uh, was tried was Svatopul Karasek, a uh, pastor of evangelical church, who was a musician on his own right. He had his uh, own uh, protest songs. Uh, and uh, so all these were very important uh, inspirations. It, especially attracted a uh, young generation of people uh, to become part of that uh, crazy uh, group uh, uh, started with Charter 77. And it makes me think of one of the great uh, miscalculations of all time when the East German government invited Bruce Springsteen to give a concert <coughs> in East Berlin with the thought because what had been happening is so many musicians were going to West Berlin and they would play right at the wall with the speakers going over into East Berlin. So all the young people were going to the wall to hear the concert. So they thought, aha, we'll have our own concert right in the middle, far away from the wall, and that'll be enough. And then they'll stop worrying about this Western music. And of course, 350,000 people came. It was incredible concert. Great act of diplomacy by Bruce Springsteen, who introduced uh, himself in, in German and spoke about freedom for the German people. And th not only, that was the end, but it was the end of East Germany, not the end of rock music. Uh, oh, that was, they didn't guess that terribly well. But this is, I think, so important for this audience who write narratives to move people. And who, what we're trying to do here is kind of bridge this gap, which I don't know if you'll agree with me, I think somewhat exists, at least in this country, where there are uh, incredibly moving narratives and people engaging. We just had an incredible panel on immigration with these really searing stories, very recognizable about immigration. Uh, and yet, what, what we're trying to do in the lab is, is bridge this gap that kind of exists in this country between policymakers, and yes, it's true now, but I think it's been true in the past too, to somehow, I, I'm curious if you have thoughts on how we could do something to have policymakers listen a little more seriously to these narratives, not just here, but also in other countries, and recognize we have Professor Wally Shoyenka sitting, uh, listening to us, who's, you know, he is recognized all over Nigeria. We've had people running up to him in the street, recognizing him, shouting, prof, prof, you know, and so I, I don't think anyone's ever done that to me. I'm not <laughs> expecting that to happen anytime soon. But, you know, the power of writing here and music, here and also uh, abroad, seems always to be put a little bit to the side when it comes to actually making the policy, whereas, you know, people like Hubble represented what people were really thinking. Well, I, I do think that um, music, especially, is a common language and is able to uh, really transform the stories. But the stories, in many ways, in countries are similar. Uh, in terms of family relationships or bravery, and, and I think it is a way to really unite people. However, I'm going to tell you something that may surprise you, policy and music. I have played the drums at Kennedy Center with Chris Bode. Yes, we all. So, I don't know how to play the drums, but I did do it. <laughs> so, but I do think that there are ways, what needs to happen, 
is for policymakers to have a human side and to be able to, uh, to really have a relationship with the people of their own country and other countries, and you don't see that enough. And so I think showing humanity, and, and I, I have tons of stories about Havel in terms of being a kind person and a humble person and wanting to be able to make that leap and to be able to put himself into other people's uh, stories and his own stories. I mean, he really was remarkable. It, I can't, you know, many things in life I do not believe, but that I would end up being good friends with somebody as remarkable as Václav Havel. About a country, when it was, I'm an immigrant, as I said, people were, and I hate to say this, but it was embarrassing to be a Czechoslovak here when it was communism and normalization and the Hungarians had a revolution and the Poles revolted every 10 years and um, you know people would say, what's the matter with your country? And Havel, I think, gave an awful lot of people like me kind of a sense that we had come from a remarkable country that had a great history with professors, by the way. The first president of Czechoslovakia, Thomas Maastricht, married an American. He did something that most men don't do to this day. He took her middle name as, her maiden name as his middle name. Thomas, her name was Charlotte Gehrig. And the Czechoslovak Constitution, Masaryk was a professor. The Czechoslovak Constitution was based on the American one with one major difference. It had equal rights language in it in 1918. You can learn a lot from many of the countries in the world, that's for sure. Here, did you want to add anything, well, Martin? And then, and then we'll turn to the uh, audience. Mentioned that what is very interesting here is really the relationship between being politician and being playwrights. Uh, that's uh, there are not so many playwrights that turn out to be successful uh, politicians. And as well, many, there's, there's a lot you just don't know. They just uh, haven't done so it. Very hopeful. Thanks uh, God that the, you are here. Uh, playwrights to be turned into politicians. Uh, it was one very interesting commentary from a British sociologist who commented on the history of Czechoslovakia in the 20th century. And uh, he said that Czechoslovakia was created by a professor, or founded by a professor, and it, it had some sort of professorial qualities, uh, some sort of slightly idealistic uh, uh, belief uh, that things are going to go uh, well, uh, and that progress is uh, something that he be taken as guaranteed. And then he said, and then uh, it ha what happened, happened during the 20th century, and Czechs, when they had a second chance to regain their freedom, they learned that professors run out, and uh, they had to be satisfied with a playwright. Uh, uh, but uh, if you uh, think about playwrights and their relationship to politics, it's, I think, uh, with all due respect to professors, playwrights have a deeper knowledge what politics is about. You can study it in the ancient uh, tragedies. Uh, uh, they knew how to transform tragic experience into some sort of knowledge and uh, do catharsis. And uh, let me to remind you, you know that better than I do, what about William Shakespeare and his uh, Hamlet who advises to his actors, play is the thing where I uh, catch the conscience of the king. The question is, do kings have conscience? <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure, but maybe they do. This is definitely day to exalt the playwrights. I think I want to give everyone here a chance to ask some questions, so we'll turn to you now. I have a couple of more questions of my own, but I'll first see who has questions in the audience. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself uh, briefly first and asking an actual question. Hi, my, hi, my name is uh, Scott Mosman. Um, um, a career and life coach uh, with a background at HBL and strategic planning. Um, the thing that really resonated is your comment that policymakers need to have a human side. The idea, it's a little mind boggling that that's not a given. Um, and I'm kind of curious why you feel that is. Why are policy make, why is that even something that is necessary and or not happening? That policymakers do not have a human side or are not presenting their human side. 
I, I actually do think policymakers have a human side, just some that exist at this moment in this country don't. Um, and so I think that uh, there is a lot in what we just heard, especially in the first segment of this that spoke to some of the things that are happening. But I do think that part of the issue is that um, I think the decisions are hard to make. And the question is whether if they have too much of a human side, there has to be some kind of way of really having very, diff make very difficult decisions. But I do think that policymakers do have a human side. And I, I speak for myself, things that I never thought I'd have to do is to send people to war in order to save other people. Uh, and how do you make a decision like that? And I think there's just a, a difficult way of kind of, um, the facts are very difficult to grasp. Or look, for instance, at what's happening in Venezuela right now. People are starving. Uh, as a result of one policymaker, and to what extent do other policymakers then deploy the powers of the United States in order to save them? So it's hard. It is very hard. I do think that a lot of policymakers do have a human side. Yeah, I, I would say I think they do. I think there is, though, I would just say, I sense you may disagree, um, in just a kind of ethos, at least in the State Department, of a kind of serious policy making and kind of long term grand strategy national interest, which, which is not surprising. Uh, but one area where I think artists here and in other countries can help humanize this politics, you're all thinking, oh, that motto, that motto, right? <laughs> but one way in which artists can help, I think, is if, if you listen to and read what's written, listen to the music, listen to what people are writing, that tells you what the people in the country are thinking versus what the government is thinking. So that kind of insight can help, I think, magnify a uh, more humane. Well, country. I do think learning about the country where you are through um, the, uh, the literature and theater and um, music, I think, is a very important part, and if you are a good policymaker, you try to do that, and you put yourself into that country's shoes, and the question is, what is the best way to do it? And I do think by reading and the literature, generally going to the theater, also why I think it's very important for our diplomats to actually speak the language of the country they're going to, in addition to knowing where it is. So I think that uh, it is very important for that aspect to know that if you are a diplomat or a policymaker, you have to get yourself into the shoes. Problem that happens, you're then accused of having clientitis. And so it is, it is not easy. And, um, and I think that one can be a policymaker and understand the humanity, but not get so sentimental that you can't do anything. Yeah. No, there is that famous story about Secretary George Schultz. I heard this, when you, a group of newly minted ambassadors was meeting with him and he had a globe in his office and he spun it and said, everybody find, identify, find your country. Everyone's, you know, scrambling and of course, there's only one right answer. Yeah. <laughs> they were looking at the country they were going to, not the country they represented. Um, do we have other questions? Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Michael Rhodes. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and Madam Secretary, I think this is a, a question for you. Um, we're, we're talking about, uh, among other things, I guess, the, the power of narrative to, um, to impact and affect policy. And we just had the Shakespeare quote, to catch the conscience of the king, and the question about, you know, do kings have consciences? And I guess this speaks, as a writer, purely from my naivete of what happens in the spaces that you're in. But I'm curious not just about the workings of kings and queens, but the workings of diplomats. And I'm, I'm curious, has it ever happened for you, Madam Secretary, where there was something that you gleaned, for instance, from this performance where we see two different sides of how a mind or two different people might relate to the notion of risk and resistance, and you have found something that you could use to, to book a hole in someone's, perhaps, hypocrisy or fear as you dealt with them, that something that arose for you through a story or drama or narrative gave you some sort of strategic 
nugget that then actually allowed you in a room to try to go at someone in a different way as you were negotiating or doing your work? Well, I, I do think that um, there's one very specific one, and it had something to do where I met with one of the major things that I had to deal with as secretary was uh, the Balkans, um, and a very hard in many different ways, and a strange issue, particularly in terms of, I always say, you know, every diplomat or every person comes with their personal baggage or their story. And it's just an accident of history that my <coughs> father had been the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia. And um, so I was the little girl in the national costume that gave flowers at the airport. And, you know, I understand the language and all kinds of things. And so what happened was that was the major issue to deal with. And I'm with Milosevic who thought that he was very charming and um, you know, Western and urbane and all kinds of things. And he's sitting there with me um, and he said, I started the history of the Serbs and I said, I know the history of the Serbs. Um, and he had his own version of it. And I think that knowing that narrative uh, was something that was very important in terms of how one dealt with it. And I think the other thing that I used to do, you, there's an awful lot of kind of small talk at the beginning of a diplomatic meeting, and I would say, I have come a long way, so I must be frank. Uh, but I, knowing something about the country, I think is a very important part, and then putting yourself in, into that person's shoes is, but I have to tell one very specific, when I first, uh, a predecessor of mine, um, Warren Christopher was a wonderful man, but he didn't speak French, and so the French care about whether you do or don't, and, so, and I do speak French, and so what happened, and it, you know, by the way, Warren Christopher, the foreign minister of France, when he was there, was Hervé de Charette, and he called him Hervé de Charetti. Uh, <laughs> so that didn't help. But anyway, I'm uh, there with uh, uh, Hubert Vidrine, and we are uh, having a meeting, and I started saying, you know, there's this great relationship between the United States and France, and it goes back to Lafayette and all that. And he said, Madeline, for God's sakes, don't be so sentimental. We helped you because we hated the British. You know, so you do have to get kind of underneath the story somehow. Do we have another? Uh, okay, yes. Thank you very much. I'm Cuban. And I know how strongly uh, Dr. Albright and Ambassador a lot have spoken on behalf of freedom in Cuba. Uh, President Howell and the history of the Czechs to this day give hope and courage to people in Cuba and Venezuela and other places. Uh, Dr. Albright talks about their narrative with Milosevic. Perhaps she could say a few things to some folks today who do not know the narrative of Marxism and communism, even members of the U.S. Congress, apparently are a little confused. Thank you very much. Well, I think I'll, I'll thank you for that comment, but I think I'll turn it into a question, which would be about, because you have had some experience with this play with the Cuban-American community in Florida, if I'm correct, so it would be interesting to hear from Martin and Susan about the resonance uh, that you for, found. For the record, uh, Frank is an uh, old time friend and cooperator. Uh, so he knows uh, that our involvement with Cuban issue has a uh, long history. But uh, let's speak about uh, my uh, very great experience with Havel's protest in Miami. Uh, these two gentlemen had the opportunity to, to play not only uh, at FIU uh, in a theater on the stage, but also in an apartment setting or uh, in a private setting for a group of Cubans, including a couple of those who uh, happened to be at that moment uh, in Miami, traveling from Havana from Cuba. Uh, so this is a uh, certainly direct link. Uh, and if uh, there is a very, uh, I would say, receptive audience uh, for Havel, you can bet uh, that among Cubans you can find for substantive reasons many, many um, uh, uh, great admirers. Uh, certainly I am not qualified to speak about Marxism uh, right now in the United States, you know, much better than I do. I only can testify 
to the danger, everyone who is believing that this is the right way to go is putting himself, herself, or his, her nation. Uh, so certainly Václav Havel was a strongly anti-totalitarian thinker and uh, actor. And I think the protest shows that, that this is a long way to go sometimes, but always there is a light of tunnel uh, in the end of uh, light uh, in the end of the tunnel. Hopefully, it is not a truck coming from the other side. <laughs> well, I, I do think it's interesting because I am. Before I was a policymaker, I was a political scientist and somebody that studied change in communist systems and. What was very interesting was what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe um, and what wasn't happening in Cuba and trying to figure out what was going on. And part of it in Central and Eastern Europe was that, first of all, uh, if there had been any original really uh, Marxists and real communists, they had been replaced by a bunch of apparatchiks and so there was nobody there that kind of represented, if there is anything brilliant in Marxism, um, <coughs> in Central and Eastern Europe. Plus also, they had information from Radio for Europe and Voice of America, and there was a lot of traveling. Cuba is an island, and whatever one thinks of Castro, or did of Fidel Castro, he was the original charismatic leader. And I think that made a difference. The other thing that was interesting, I think if there's one single person that helped put an end to communism, it was Pope John Paul as a Pole. And he was able in so many ways. And so the thought was that John Paul was going to Havana, but the Catholicism is not as embedded in Cuba as it was in Poland. And so that wasn't, we kept looking for what could change the situation in Cuba. Then what happened was the shoot down of the unarmed planes. And um, all of a sudden, there was this, I was at the UN at the time, trying to figure out how to condemn Cuba for what they had done. And actually, what was interesting, the Czechs were always the most helpful in international aspects of things. And, and I will tell the story if I might. What happened was I had instructions to condemn Cuba. And what the United States government gave me was a transcript of what the Cuban pilots were saying to each other as they were chasing these unarmed planes over international waters. And everything was in English, in English except one word, cojones. <laughs> um, and so my, what happened was I went out and I spoke to the press and I said, it's not cojones, it's cowardice. The, uh, what happened was that the um, press was appalled that I would use names like word like that. And the Latin representatives on the Security Council said no woman would ever use a term like that. And so, um, but President Clinton loved it. And so uh, I went down to represent him at the memorial service uh, that was held in the Orange Bowl for the fallen pilots. And I walk in on the arm of the father one of the fallen pilots, and 70,000 Cuban Americans stand up and yell, Cuba Libre, Madam Cajones. And that is I am wrong as that even now in Miami. Uh, I, just a very short uh, remark, with all due respect to my great friend, uh, Menno Albright, uh, I am not sure about uh, the status of Fidel Castro as a charismatic leader. We are now uh, doing a project in Miami with Czech organization called Postdelum, which is about memory, a conflict and reconciliation. And if you read uh, the stories of real Cuban revolutionaries, uh, people spent 20, 16 years in jail because this Fidel Castro's leadership, because of his narcissism and eccentricity, betrayed them. Uh, so I don't think that even Cubans now would be still sharing this crazy capacity of Fidel Castro. Maybe there are some international leaders who still believe in this type of spell, but it is going on. Uh, so uh, I think that if Václav Havel were here, uh, I remember the scene we were in the United Nations, I was sitting with Havel there, uh, and Cuba is very close to us because uh, it's uh, alphabetic order. And Fidel Castro was sitting there looking at Havel in, very, uh, in a very shy manner. Uh, and I don't know what was going on in his head in this moment. Because we then uh, win uh, three times in a row uh, 
uh, fighting for the resolution in Geneva uh, condemning the human rights situation in Cuba. The United States lost that year before us, and then we checked, did it with help of Menendez three times in a row. I think we have one more question, and then I think we'll have to end with this one. Thank you. That was a great story. Can you imagine being able to take this class and having all these stories. They're very lucky students. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Sophia Skiles. I'm an actor, but I'm also a, an elected official. I serve on my local board of education um, in New Paltz, uh, New York, where I live. And I'm very curious, you know, the times what they demand of us and how they change us and how we are changed by it. I'm so curious firsthand, you know, Vasil Pavel's kind of this mythological, mythological artist citizen, right? And I'm curious to know, having experienced him firsthand, to what degree did he as an artist change the role of being a statesperson or was he changed by the sort of political role that he was elected to? Um, to what degree did he bring his artistry and change that template and vice versa? Great Wonderful, last question. Thank you so much and thank you for your service. Uh, uh, ask me to give you my answer. Uh, sadly, Havel had been repeatedly asked, uh, uh, did you have to change uh, yourself, uh, uh, being transformed from a dissident playwright to president? Uh, obviously, it's a different task, different responsibilities. If someone who has uh, who wrote Power of Powerless now is himself in power, obviously it's a different situation. But how adamantly and repeatedly said, "No, it's always me. I, I didn't change myself uh, substantively." He was making new experience, and uh, some experience to him by surprise, uh, for sure. And uh, uh, I think that he. Um, proved several times that he was a mortal human being making sins, not a god, that can arrange everything for others. Uh, he was saying that today uh, through his performance, do it yourself, uh, uh, don't blame uh, me uh, for your own mistake and don't make me responsible for what I'm not able to be responsible. Uh, so he made some political mistakes, I would say, uh, did he do right so when he resigned to his post of president of uh, Czechoslovakia too soon in the summer of 1992? Was it a mistake or uh, some of his friends like Polish uh, dissident uh, journalist Adam Michnik uh, wrote a couple of critical comments on Havel in that moment. And I can go on and on. Uh, so Havel had his ups and downs. Uh, he was a vulnerable, uh, very sensitive human being. He was more, I would say, tortured or tormented by his own mistakes uh, than anyone else. He had a very complicated private life, as uh, uh, we all know. So uh, his place certainly mirror or reflect uh, who Havel was. So uh, my suggestion to you, read the place uh, uh, that he wrote as a president. And the most important one, I think, is the last one, called Leading uh, the Party. Uh, that speaks for what it was for Havel to be a president. Because I think that uh, one of his uh, political deep belief was uh, that politicians should not only want to get rise to power, but they should know how to live and when and how and what is going to uh, be left behind themselves and their legacy. If what's of Havel's legacy is today seen as a bunch of slogans we can repeat and uh, admire Havel how great he was, I think that we would be serving very badly uh, to the legacy itself. It was Havel himself who was ridiculizing his own statements uh, uh, again and again. Uh, so uh, I think that Havel is a complex figure and uh, Hannah Harens once said that we living in the dark times, we have a right for certain illumination. An illumination come from the flickering light uh, some lives of some people uh, can uh, offer us. And I think that Havel's life was uh, maybe a small light that still is around. So I cannot say anything more than that. Thank you. I would love to give you, Madam Secretary, the final word. Uh, I, do, I was going to mention leaving because I think it's a very interesting play, but I do want to, I obviously know a very different side of Havel. I did, um, 
I saw him as a policymaker, and I dealt with him as a policymaker, and that was not easy, frankly. So, uh, in terms of trying to get uh, the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia to do something on an issue, so. Um, but I do think there's a personal story I'd love to tell. What happened after he came here on his first uh, uh, trip, when I helped to arrange it, and I, I wasn't in office, um, and I got called by one of the people that was with him, he went to Bermuda. Uh, and I said to this guy, Sasha Vondra, when Havel gets bored, call me. So like in 24 hours, he called me and he said, come down. So I go down there, and uh, what happened was uh, we spent a lot of time walking on the beach and different things, but then also he wanted to go to the NASA tracking station. And I was the interpreter for everything. And so he asked the people there, the uh, military people, whether they had ever seen any aliens. And I thought, I can't <laughs> translate this. This <laughs> is a crazy president. Uh, but one of the fun, I mean, literally, you know. So, but one of the lovely parts was walking on the beach with him. And because uh, there is no seacoast to Bohemia, uh, he said that the Czechs um, always look to the skies and that they're really, they, they do believe a lot of them in astrology and, um, but really that sense of being in a landlocked country and yet having the vision to look to the skies is something that I think describes him in many ways. Um, but the humanity of this man who did not take himself seriously, who continued to sign letters with a heart uh, and various aspects, I mean literally. And the thing that makes me angry, I have to say, is that people in now, they call it Czechia, which doesn't sound like the right thing, um, and don't recognize the fact that they had a giant as a president who was so well regarded abroad and all of a sudden brought that sense of morality and humility at the same time, and they don't they don't respect enough that they had a giant as a president. Mm -hmm. Can I make a small it's very, very short. Uh, yeah, right now working on a movie, uh, 90 minutes long, based on the last three years of Havel's life. Uh, the movie's title will be Havel speaking. Can you hear me? So we'll come with this movie here in the fall, Absolutely. and I hope that uh, you will. Uh, Accept our relation. That, that, that sounds wonderful. Well, wow. Drew and David. Hi everybody, thank you for your patience uh, with, with uh, our very jammed schedule. Um, 
it's my absolute honour and pleasure to introduce Heather Raffo, who is going to present a small segment, just a 10, 15 minutes from a play that's really new and really in progress, uh, the Migration Play. Um, Heather's a long-term friend and collaborator of us here at Georgetown and with the lab, and I particularly want to note her work with Professor Maya Roth, who has been uh, a dramaturg and uh, collaborator for many years as Heather's come to visit and work on new plays. Um, so um, please make Heather welcome for the next 10, 15 minutes. Thank you. The Migration Play. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here because I'm beginning a project and I'll definitely say I have way more questions than answers. I've spent the last two decades working on theater that represents my Iraqi side. And I had about 100 relatives in Iraq at the start of this second war, and I now have one. So this sense of a migration crisis of refugees being scattered across the world is something that's on my mind hugely. But also as a theater practitioner, I've been watching how narrative, a narrative around refugees and migrants is itself a marketplace. And so when I put those two things together, I said, okay, this is, this is where I need to put my mind, but I'm not sure how. So the thing that I've been questioning greatly is, I know a lot of us have been talking about empathy this week, and I've spent 20 years working on the empathy of the theater and, you know, being, I, I was successful in that job. You know, I, I created empathy on behalf of Iraqis everywhere I went, but I'm really questioning. So I just offer that. I offer that I'm actually questioning the role of empathy in the theater, and I think that might be my next crisis. And um, back to what Babak was referencing, um, I really think value is the word I'm after rather than empathy, because I could care less if somebody necessarily understands or empathizes with me if they value me or value my family member for whatever reason. So this idea of value for a human being turned into somehow a pursuit of value that might also just be purely economic. As in, why did my cousin who's a surgeon not get placed anywhere, but my cousin who's a interior designer get a placement somewhere. What's the value on those human, what are they gonna bring to those different nations? So I'm, I started following money trails. I started following China and which ports they were buying up. <laughs> I was writing lots of scenes on that, but for today I'm just gonna give you, I'm gonna try and read for you a bunch of characters, so forgive, you'll just have to go with it. None of them would be represented by me. But um, I think that, back to what Madeline Albright said, do policymakers have too much of a human side? I think this, this, that's gonna be my next question for a long time and where this play lives and how I follow value and try to experiment with when we use empathy and when we don't. Airport checkpoint. Girl's net worth $483 and her education. Soldier, I need another form of ID. Girl, that's my passport. Soldier, it's new. Girl, it's a brand new passport. Give me another form of ID. What, the name of my father's village? A driver's license. I walked here. From where? My father's village. How long? Five hours. To go where? With what? To college. With what? What college are you flying to without bags, books? Show me your ticket. My letter of acceptance. What are you going to do there? Study. About books. Clothes. When you arrive. My letter of acceptance clearly states all I have to do is get to my home airport. Once I arrive in country, they house me, feed me, pay my books and clothing allowance. I've never heard of a place like this. Like what? You must be worth a lot. Girls your age walk themselves to Libya to leave by boat. How are you going by plane? Most girls your age have a phone number sewn into their sleeves of the madam they'll call when they arrive in Lampedusa so they can get to work right away. I'm not flying to Europe. I'm going, you know what the work is like over there? You must be worth a lot. Drugs can only be sold once, but a girl can be sold 15 times a day or more. You sure you want to go? 
this is my future. Who's your madam? I don't have one. What jobs have you worked before, hairdresser? I'm going to study. How much money do you have now on you to pay your traffickers? How much money do you have? I told you all I have to do is get on the plane. When I get off, they pay my school, housing. This is all I have. Knowing he's after a bribe, she reaches for her money. He takes it all. You can believe anything you want, but when they find girls like you for sale, they send them back. They're never the same. You understand me? Not even your father will recognize me. You're going to thank me later. $483. Now go home. Whatever you were promised, it's never going to happen. Girl, I'll take my chance. Main Stage Theater Madrid, expected gross, $630. Artistic director, those are our best black actors. Playwright, what do you mean by our? Artistic director, the country's best, Madrid's best. You won't find better in Barcelona. I train most of them at the institute myself. Playwright, it's not the actor's fault. You gave them the old ending. Of course they're reading it wrong. He's a hero, a tragic hero, but I rewrote the ending. I can't produce it that way. <laughs> he lives instead of dies, that's all. Why does everybody have to walk away feeling good? You can't let people off the hook. Look, I want a character to live, to live on. He's survived so much already. Why can't he make it here too? Because it's not believable. You're making my point precisely. He survived so much already? It's a true story? Okay, okay, I even believe you. He walked from Mali to Libya. He pays traffickers to take him to the coast. They sell him in the market instead. He's a human slave. He works a couple years, escapes through European traffickers. His boat capsizes, but he can swim. He makes it to Spain, gets stuck in detention, finally gets out, looks for work. He gets beaten up by European hatred. He dies. No, he gets beaten up. He lives. To do what? We got to feel bad. Not even the Libyan slave owners killed him. We killed him. Did we give him justice? No. We need the whole audience to want him to live, but no, 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 no. We killed him by ignoring him, by driving past him on the side of the road. We're scared. He's so black. I wish I could help, but he could rob me, rape me. We have to face ourselves because we're too afraid to face him. He has to die. What if he doesn't? Nobody cries. There's no play. He could live and fall in love. He could be an artist, an actor. He could play himself. He could become a valuable member of the community. How? He could see a small boy hanging from a balcony, scale four stories, and lift the boy to safety. <laughs> That's a movie. He becomes a school teacher for refugees. Crisis fatigue. A footballer? Racist. They can't only be valuable as footballers. A person. A person, a cafe owner, an engineer, a nurse. Can't you see now why he has to die? It's the only story. Why are you resisting it? Because it's the only story, so write it better. It's been written 20 times, 100 times. Every single play on stage in Madrid with an African character dies. He dies. The African always dies. Not every play. Every play, no. Every single play. Think about them. Shall I list them? No. Shouldn't the audience be forced to consider? I want an African man to live. Okay, okay. We bring the real guy on stage after the show. A talk back. He lives in real life. But even the Greeks, Shakespeare, if you want to sell tickets, I want to say something that's never been said before by a European on stage in Spain. If you want to make money, he has to die. The wall, $150 billion annually to maintain. Ben, the wall's too expensive. It's a waste on every level, and it won't keep them out. Ted, think of it like an Olympic ski jump. It's beautiful, something spectacular. Ben, unless it goes across the entire country, it's useless. It's not useless. They always find a way in. We want them to. No, the wall won't control the problem. The wall controls the narrative. Not if it pushes them further into the desert. We got so many guys out on patrol now, we can't get goods through anymore. We've got to make it harder. We've made it impossible. How much harder do you need than impossible harder? Like the Muslim ban, that's been very effective. Not if we want to still do business. A hundred and ten billion dollar contract to build and sell U.S. weapons. Do you know how much the Saudis love the Muslim ban? UAE, those Muslims love the Muslim ban. Mexico is not Saudi Arabia. Its trade value is in avocados. No, people, I like to call them workers, migrants, not asylum seekers, right. But if border agents start talking to people, they'll let in every crying mother and turn away the fucked up 17-year-old boys. We need the boys sneaking in, ready to work, hiding. We're taking a wrecking ball to something that needs a scalpel. I'm not saying we don't want them. 
but we need to make it harder. God, it's harder than it's ever been. Making them more illegal keeps them on the run. Not only are they cheaper, they're quiet. Come on, if even a quarter of these people settled in suburbs started having kids, the demand on social services, it would change the face of the nation irrevocably. Look, you're a brown man and you're talking about the face of this nation. But the middle class is over, isn't it? Can we afford to pay the workforce we need minimum wage? Can we afford our aging population? The American dream isn't being middle class, it's striving to be middle class. Our part of town, their part of town. Our schools, their schools. Creating micro economies so the country will, will what? The border only works long term if it's inside the nation, not around it. Right, so why are we wasting money on a wall? Because it's the greatest obstacle course ever built. It is Iron Man. They run, they swim, they go from Central America all the way up through Mexico. They have to be superhuman, drought resistant, indefatigably smart to not get caught and the gold medal event is the border. It's survival of the fittest. We get the fucking best and the route weeds out the rest. Airport checkpoint, girl's net worth to be determined. Girl, I walked here, guard, from where? My father's village, how long? Hours, to go where with what? You're going barefoot? To college, barefoot. Show me your ticket. My letter of acceptance, where are you gonna, what are you gonna do there? Study about your shoes when you arrive. My letter of acceptance clearly states all I have to do is get to my home airport. Once I arrive in country, they house me, feed me, pay for my books and closing. You know what the work is like over there? Over where? You must be worth a lot. Don't touch me. I'll be direct with you. Drugs can only be sold once, but a girl can be sold 15 times a day or more. He touches her obscenely. She stands frozen. Artistic director, could we try it once where you're crying maybe? <laughs> girl, isn't she used to this sort of thing? The script is clear. She stands her ground. Artistic director, yeah, but you still got to be sympathetic. Okay, let's see it again. Guard, I've never heard of a place like this. Girl, like what? You know what the work is like over there. You must be worth a lot. Stop touching me. I'll be direct with you. Drugs can only be sold once, but a girl could be sold 15 times a day or more. Sex slave, Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, $670 a day. You sure you want to go? Actress salary, off-Broadway Lord B, $450 a week. Yeah, I like her better barefoot. That's good. It helps. 